Tonight, the Toronto Blue Jays are back on home soil and fans and players couldn't be more pumped. Driven to right field. It's deep. It's gone. The Rogers Center was electric tonight. A full capacity crowd cheering on the Jays as they kick off their season with their first home opener since 2019. Plus, it's a lot of people to bring in over the course of, you know, uh, two weeks. Summerlicious is coming back to Toronto after being cancelled the last two years. Restaurant owners hoping the return of the food festival gives them just the boost they need. And people usually just come here to have fun and whatever. And then to hear there was a shooting, it's, it's sad. A teenager is dead, two others injured, and the shooter still at large after gunfire broke out in a popular tourist area in Niagara Falls. Good evening, I'm Kelda Yoon. The roof may be closed, but that didn't seem to matter to the tens of thousands of fans at Rogers Centre tonight. A full capacity crowd cheering on the Blue Jays in their big home opener, their first one in three years. Our Greg Ross is at the game. He joins us now live at Rogers Centre. Greg, we'll get to the game in a sec. Tell us about the atmosphere there tonight. There was definitely a buzz in the air tonight, Kelda. I can tell you that uh, right from the right from the start of the day. I mean, there were people lined up outside the gates long before the the game started. They were ready to get into this building. Remember, it's been three years since the Blue Jays have had a home opener or a season opener here at the Rogers Center, playing the majority of their games the last two seasons outside of the country when it comes to home games they were able to get back into uh, the Rogers Center towards the end of last season and play maybe the last third of the season here but uh, this was the first time they've had that uh, season opener buzz and how incredible was it to be inside there and see uh, 45,000 plus fans packed into the Rogers Center I mean the last time the Jays were here they had limitations uh, on capacity because of the pandemic uh, when they first came back last year they were only allowed to have 15,000 fans inside the Rogers Center. It went up to 30 uh, by the end of the season, uh, but uh, now 45,000 fans inside that building. They were loud, they were excited, and the, and the players many of whom more than 20 players on the Blue Jays roster have never experienced an opening day here in Toronto. They've never uh, experienced a full stadium here at the Rogers Center. They got to see both tonight and they were pretty happy and pretty excited themselves about that Kelda. Yeah for sure. Now now Greg this game uh, it didn't get off to the kind of start that fans would have predicted or wanted but our Jays are known to rally back. Yeah, well, they came back in a big, uh, big time kind of way. Let's just first talk about the Blue Jays starting pitcher, Jose Barrios, uh, who got the start in this uh, season opener, and he had a very rough start, gave up four runs in the first inning, and he was taken out of the game at that point. Uh, by the time uh, the fifth inning rolled around, the Blue Jays found themselves trailing seven to nothing but they started to chip away at that score chip away at that score and then in the bottom of the fifth inning Teoscar Hernandez hit a three run home run to tie this game up at seven they went back and forth back and forth after that and at last check the Blue Jays were up 10 to 8 going into the top of the ninth just three outs away from ending this game and winning uh, now keep in mind uh, also Kelda that the Blue Jays have had a long opening day losing streak they have lost 10 opening day games going into this one here today so they were looking to end that streak and it looks very much like they are going to end that streak and not extend it to 11 straight games the Blue Jays right now leading the Texas Rangers looking to close this game out uh, and uh, again excitement inside there the Blue Jays able to come back from a huge deficit we saw those big bats in this game we saw some big home runs to Oscar Hernandez uh, Jansen also hit a home run for the Blue Jays and uh, again that's the kind of atmosphere that fans have missed for the last two years and uh, that's the kind of excitement here that fans have missed for the last two years. This is a team that people have high expectations for Kelda and today they showed us why. I hope they go all the way. Go Jays go. Thanks so much Greg. That's our Greg Ross live for us tonight. 
Well, after a two-year hiatus, Summerlicious is coming back to Toronto. For two weeks, restaurants across the city will once again be offering up special prefix menus. Now, the program that celebrates the city's vibrant food scene is being changed slightly this year to make it easier for restaurants to participate. And as Dale Manakdag reports, that's welcome news for restaurant owners still struggling to recover from the pandemic. <laughs> Italian comfort food spot 7 number says things are heating up. Sales haven't climbed back to pre-pandemic levels yet, but it's getting closer. Every single week is a small percentage better than the last. They're small percentages, but clearly climbing. The return of Summerlicious is more welcome news as the industry tries to recover. The program has served nearly 8 million meals since 2003 and generated over $350 million for the local restaurant industry. At seven numbers, it usually boosts business 25 to 30 percent. It brings in tons of new clients and then obviously from there you grow some regulars out of it. Uh, and it's an influx at the end of the summer when it's traditionally fairly quiet. Vacation, school, back to school, cottages, so to bring it in then is fantastic. This year it will be running from April 12th to the 18th and the city is making it easier for restaurants to sign up by cutting unnecessary red tape. They don't have time for a lot of paperwork that involves City Hall and quite frankly we don't have time as we try to move the city towards recovery for a lot of paperwork either. The city is also making it free for restaurants to participate. It will save this restaurant which has two locations roughly $3,000. They've come through sort of on every front, you know, grants uh, all along the way, uh, the Cafe TO program, this year the patio fees were waived, and now having some malicious fees waived yet doing the program is just putting a little more in our pockets. The program also gives patrons a chance to try a variety of restaurants without breaking the bank. Andrew Dobson, who runs a food and travel site, says it's a great opportunity to get value out of the dining experience. Is like the Ritz Carlton, the Four Seasons, the St. Regis Hotel, their fine dining restaurants, which typically uh, have a very high price point, become really affordable to people. It's also a way to support local spots that have weathered the pandemic. If you live in your in a neighborhood where you find a restaurant that's in there that you've never been to before, it's a great excuse to support local businesses in your community as well. Applications for the program open next week. Dale Manukduk, CBC News, Toronto. All right, time now for a first look at your weekend forecast with Victoria Fenn Alvarado at the Weather Network. Victoria, a bit wet today in the GTA, but not too bad. How's it looking for the weekend? Not too terrible today. Still some spotty showers we're going to be looking looking at for the next couple of days. Friday overnight, if you're headed home from the Jays game, a cool uh, overnight ahead, feeling more like the minus two. Saturday morning, though, three degrees. Those icons indicating rain, don't be fooled by it. It's not a washout. Mostly just spotty showers here and there. Toronto, eight degrees. On Saturday, Hamilton as well. Winds are getting up to seven, and Ottawa getting up to 10 degrees. But we do have some rain in the forecast. My prediction for tomorrow's game, the Dome will most likely be closed with those spotty showers. If you are traveling for your day, be sure to pack an umbrella just in case. Plenty of cloud cover, though, throughout southern Ontario. Most of the rain is set towards the east. That's the Ottawa area, specifically Bancroft as well. Uh, also, for Sunday, temperatures very similar to Saturday. Toronto, 8 degrees. But check out Windsor, getting up to 11 degrees there. So we're on the uphill climb. We're going to start getting warmer. Our upper, upper level pattern right now is still fairly cool. But check out this wave of orange. That's all good news for next week. I'm going to talk more about that in your long range forecast. I'll be back to talk about these conditions. Check out the temperatures, 16 degrees on Tuesday. <laughs> like the sound of that. Thanks so much, Victoria. A teenage boy is dead and two other teens injured after a shooting inside a popular tourist spot on Clifton Hills in Niagara Falls. Niagara police are still searching for a suspect tonight. And as Chris Glover reports, they are hoping for help from the public. The festival-like atmosphere of one of Canada's biggest tourist spots is today shattered for a murder investigation. Surprising because you usually don't hear about stuff happening like this in tourist areas like this. Police say just after midnight, gunshots rang out in the heart of Niagara Falls, killing one teen boy and injuring two other teen boys. With such severe injuries, they had to be airlifted to trauma centers out of town. One was listed as critical, uh, but uh, we've just received uh, an update that both victims at the hospital are now in stable condition and they're just facing a long road to recovery. 
All three of the victims were from outside the Niagara region, but police won't say where since family are still being notified. This is promotional video from the Great Canadian Midway. Police say the shooting happened inside here following some sort of interaction. Whether they were specifically targeted or, you know, somehow they became involved in this interaction, we're not exactly sure yet, but this wasn't a random act of violence of someone just coming in and indiscriminately spraying. The Midway says it will remain closed until Monday, but won't give additional comment or say if employees were among those hurt. People usually just come here to have fun and whatever, and then to hear there was a shooting, it's, it's sad. Investigators released a description of a blue truck seen speeding away, a Ford F-150 with tinted windows and a moonroof. The truck has visible damage that police think was sustained while fleeing. There's no front license plate and it was missing a door handle. On a strip known for fun, the mayor hopes this doesn't change that. We're the number one leisure destination in all of Canada and we pride ourselves on being very safe. So when something isolated like this happens, it doesn't help. And we don't need people worrying or being concerned about what happens in Niagara Falls. Today, some tourists are uneasy. I feel confused and it sounds a little bit unsafe here, but yeah, I don't know. It's scary. Others, though, say this fatal shooting won't keep them away. Just hope that it, um, this doesn't happen again. Everyone can stay safe and no one gets hurt. Police are hoping someone has information or video that can help them crack this case. Chris Glover, CBC News, Toronto. The victim of yesterday's deadly shooting outside Sherbourne Station has been identified. Toronto police say he is 21-year-old Kartik Vasudev, a student at Seneca College. As Seneca confirms he was a student from India in his first semester studying marketing management. The shooting happened just outside the subway station at 5 p.m. Vasudev suffered multiple gunshot wounds and was rushed to hospital where he was pronounced dead. Toronto police haven't released any suspect information. They're asking any witnesses to contact them. A Toronto police officer is facing an assault charge tonight. Constable Samir Kara was charged after police responded to a call near Dundas West and Keel Streets yesterday. Police say a man and a woman were involved in a dispute when the man allegedly hit the woman. Now, this isn't the first time Kara, shown here on the right, has had charges brought against him. Kara and two other officers were acquitted in a high-profile gang sexual assault trial stemming from an incident in 2015. The three Toronto police officers were found not guilty after a Superior Court justice found inconsistencies in the complainant's testimony. Kara was not on duty during yesterday's incident. He has been suspended with pay and is scheduled to appear in court on May 19th. Toronto City Councillor Kristen Wong Tam wants to make the move to provincial politics. She'll be running for the NDP in the next election. And she's not the only Toronto councillor attempting to make that leap. Michael Ford, nephew to Premier Doug Ford, has announced he'll be running for the PCs. Lorenda Redekop has more. I never thought in a million, million years that this would be my trajectory. Kristen Wong Tam hopes to head to Queen's Park. She made the announcement together with NDP leader Andrea Horvath and the current MPP, Suze Morrison. She won't be running due to health issues. After 12 years as a city councillor, Wong Tam says she wants to have an impact at the provincial level. I've been very focused on trying to address the challenges around the mental health um, and addictions crisis. This is something I care very deeply about and cities don't offer that service as, as many of you will know. It's a purview within the provincial government. A very popular local uh, politician and that will certainly help her in, in that race. The fact that she was kind of seen to straddle the Liberals and the NDP means that there are probably a number of Liberal partisans who would be willing to you know, vote against their usual pattern. Etobicoke North Councillor Michael Ford is also trying to make the leap for the PCs, but in York Southwestern. The seat is NDP now, often held by the Liberals in the past, though the PCs did come in second here the last time. They think it's a seat that they can potentially pick off because of the Ford name and the whole idea of Ford Nation. Will it work? Probably not, but there's no cost to Ford. No cost because he can go back to his councillor seat if he doesn't win. The party confirms Michael Ford was appointed by his uncle, Premier Doug Ford, who has appointed other candidates. It has a look of nepotism to it because, in a way, it is nepotism, right? When, uh, you know, an uncle chooses 
a nephew to to run but i suspect for you know the the general public making the choice uh that's probably not that big a deal. When you call my office... Michael Ford says he'll donate his city hall salary during the provincial campaign. Wong Tam says if she doesn't win, she won't be returning to city hall. And she'll step down as soon as the election campaign begins. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. Welcome back. The owner of a mobile soup kitchen in downtown Oshawa is promising a comeback after local councillors shut him down. Ray Bond set up a nonprofit food truck for people experiencing homelessness and food insecurity. And he had a permit to park right behind City Hall, but now he's getting the boot. Angelina King explains. Still wanting to help his community, Ray Bond is volunteering at a food bank. While the nonprofit food truck he set up for people who need meals and necessities sits unused, after Oshawa City Councillors kicked him out of a parking space behind City Hall. It's disheartening. Bond founded the Community Assisted Meals Program, or CAMP, at the beginning of the pandemic, when most services for unhoused people in Oshawa were forced to close. It grew to include about 100 volunteers who, up until last week, handed out free lunches, clothing, toiletries, even pet food to about 120 people a day, including Ray Borg. It meant everything to me and even the elderly that was helping out in my building. They give a lot more than the other food places. They give like vegetables and fruits and eggs and uh, bread. Bond says he spent over $10,000 to get camp running and the program doesn't accept government money. His permit to park at City Hall expired and councillors denied him an extension. He hopes the decision will be reversed. We have no, comp literally no complaints. Our engagement with the community is, is fantastic. We have so much support. We're grateful for their contribution to our community. But Oshawa's mayor, who experienced homelessness himself, says he doesn't want the truck behind City Hall because there are other organizations already serving that area. He says services like camp should be strategically placed. I would like to see them work with the agencies in the South End to be able to provide their services there. But Bond says camp is unique. It's a one-stop shop for necessities and people can take the food to go. A lot of those people you know, don't necessarily want to sit down in a room full of people. Well, the mayor says Oshawa is rebounding economically with numbers from Statistics Canada to back that up. Durham Region says the number of people experiencing homelessness has more than doubled in the last four years to more than 550 people, the bulk of them in Oshawa. And now without camp? I can't, I can't get the food that I need, you know. I can't, I can't even make my own food. Nobody does what this trailer does. Bond vows to apply for a new permit again later this month. Angelina King, CBC News, Toronto. Actor Will Smith has been banned from the Oscars for 10 years for slapping comedian Chris Rock. The decade-long ban will apply to the Oscars and other Film Academy events. Now, Smith slapped Rock in the face during the Oscars last month. It happened after Rock made a joke about Smith's wife's hair. The Academy saying in a statement today that Smith's actions were unacceptable and harmful. Smith has apologized. All right, let's go back to Victoria now at the Weather Network for a look at your full forecast, Victoria. I'm looking forward to some warmer temperatures next week. We just have to get through the next couple of days first. Just get through the next couple of days, then the warmer conditions come. But I have some news that might burst your bubble a little bit too later on in the week. I'll get to that in a moment. But first, let's talk about Saturday again. 8 degrees is your forecasted high. Typically, we should be around the 10 degree mark, but I like to put things into perspective. Back in 1975, we got to minus 9.4, not even close to that this year. That's great news. But back in 1955, we were at 21.1 degrees. Anyways, that's my history lesson for you all. I just thought it was nice to put it into perspective a little bit that eight degrees is great for this time of year. We do have some spotty showers in case you missed it for your Saturday and cloud cover in through your Sunday. But with all this cloud cover, I know we're all hoping where's the sunshine. I'm asking myself the same thing. Luckily, conditions temperature wise is going to be in the double digits. Finally, on Tuesday, 16 degrees and even into Friday up to 12. But then we get a dip back down to the cooler conditions later on into next week. Now, the conditions for later on in your week are going to be warm, but it's also going to be quite rainy. 
for Tuesday into Wednesday and even Thursday for Toronto, we are forecasting some rain and we're still looking at our models here at the Weather Network. But right now we're looking at 10 to 15 millimeters possible, but projections could change within the next couple of days. Monday temperatures getting up to 17 degrees in Windsor and then for Tuesday up to 17 degrees in London. So patio weather slightly approaching right Toronto 16 degrees and those icons are indicating the rainfall spotty showers for Tuesday but then by Wednesday that's where an abundance of rain could be seen could be possible that's the projections that I was explaining a little earlier could be could differ in the next couple of days but temperatures still warm winds are up to 18 degrees so really you can take the good temperatures with the rain unless you like rain sometimes it's a good thing Ottawa Monday 12 degrees that's it's your day to get out. Thanks so much, Victoria. Thank you. Finally tonight, have you ever wondered what the strangest street in our city is? Well, one local guide claims he knows the answer and took us on a walking tour of the area. Take a look. Ready for an adventure? Yes! All right, let's go. Hi, I'm Harley Karoulis, and I run Toronto History Walks. Welcome to Craven Road. If you notice, the west side is fenced all the way up to Danforth. Our Toronto History Walks I created uh, in 2019 to bring people together and to explore the city uh, and to understand our history, which I think is very, very important. So we're going to head down Craven Road and take a look at the history. I've just introduced a whole a new batch of tours for the spring and for the summer, uh, but I've uh, probably conducted about 600 walking tours. I don't think there's anything like it in the city of Toronto, like Craven Road. I'm uh, uh, relatively new to Toronto. I'm still exploring and it was wonderful to find this uh, meetup group. It gives informative um, tidbits of information. It expands my horizons and my knowledge about Toronto. I live in East Toronto and I wanted to find out where is this craziest street in Toronto? <laughs> and sure enough, it's Craven Road. This is what seems to make or break this neighborhood is this fence. I was really the only walking tour uh, still uh, providing services, even though on a limited basis of five people uh, during lockdown. I think people really enjoyed it, uh, just kind of coming together in a very, very dark time. And now we are able to get out and enjoy Toronto even more. And that is our show for you tonight and for the week. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great weekend and we'll see you back here on Monday. Have a great night.